Our sermon text this morning is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 19 through verse 28. These are the words of God. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves, calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life, death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. We ask that you would use your word now in our lives. Convict us, encourage us, Enlarge our hearts, strengthen our faith, grant us boldness. For we ask all of this in Jesus' name, and amen. amen. One of the reasons Christians are not as bold as they ought to be is because they do not know what covenant they are of. We have heard the stories of saints who have smelled of heaven, They have sizzled with the aroma of angels, and this is just what we are after. We want that full assurance of faith, that boldness that marks Christian faithfulness. Now some, not knowing the kingdom of heaven, have looked upon such saints and mistaken their boldness for pride. They've mistaken their freedom for madness. Some believers even, who have drifted too far from the Heavenly Father, have made this same kind of misjudgment. Even so, this is exactly what we're after. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before Nebuchadnezzar's fire. Or Jonathan, Saul's son, climbing up the Philistine garrison, outnumbered. Now someone might say, not everyone is a Jonathan. Not everyone is going to climb up to that Philistine garrison and face all of them by himself, nothing but him and his shield bearer. I would grant to you that there are many members of the body of Christ. There are certain inclinations. There are certain personality types. I'm not commending to you some kind of animal courage in this particular sermon. I'm commending to you something that every Christian must have every Christian has a right to have, and that is the boldness that comes from the new covenant. The boldness that comes from the truth that our Lord Jesus Christ has ascended into heaven for us to represent us there. We have a great high priest, and because of that, we can live on earth with boldness. That's precisely what our text commends to us. Let's consider a survey of this passage. After Moses spoke God's word to the people at Sinai, he took the blood of calves and goats, he mixed it with water, and sprinkled both the book of the covenant and all the people. That's verse 19. Imagine what that would have been like there at the base of Mount Sinai. Blood of calves, blood of goats, mixed with water, and then sprinkled upon you. You gathered around, and Moses is sprinkling you with the blood of the covenant, binding you to God, guaranteeing you of your purification, guaranteeing you of this dedication that all of God's word to you is true. And he's actually sprinkling the altar that was built, and he's sprinkling the book of the covenant, the very words that Moses had received from God that he wrote down in a book. He's sprinkling all of that with blood, saying, you are God's people, he is your God, you are bound to him. This book that was sprinkled with the blood was not just any book, but it was the book of the covenant covered in this blood. Thus far in the Hebrews passage, 
Paul is referring to Exodus 24, when the Mosaic Covenant was inaugurated in blood. But then, as he goes on, he carries this same theme further into Israel's history. The tabernacle itself and the vessels of ministry were also sprinkled with blood. That's verse 21 of our text. But in Exodus 24, when the Mosaic Covenant was first cut, there was no tabernacle to be sprinkled with this blood. So you step back from our Hebrews text and say, what's going on here? Well, Paul is mashing together all sorts of um, times of Israel's history, but he's putting them all together into this one theme, this sprinkling with the blood of the covenant. Although that tabernacle did not exist at Exodus 24, it did on the Day of Atonement in Leviticus chapter 16. On that day, blood was not only sprinkled on people, as it was in Exodus 24, but it was actually placed upon the horns of the altar. That altar where sacrifices were offered up to God, blood put there on the horns of the altar. And it was even brought in within the veil of the temple and sprinkled on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. We're told in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 16 and verse 20, that this sprinkling of the very tabernacle of the vessels of ministry atoned for the holy place and for the tabernacle. This blood atonement was necessary, for in the law, nearly everything was cleansed by blood. Without it, there was no forgiveness of sin. That's verse 22. Therefore, it was necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with blood sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with a better sacrifice. That's verse 23. For Christ did not enter into man-made holy places. Many Levitical priests had done so, but Christ as our great high priest did something different. He didn't enter into man-made holy places, which were figures of, of the true, but into heaven itself to appear before God for us. Verse 24. Now, those last two verses of the text, if you read them carefully, if you pay attention to the words coming off the page, cause you to raise an eyebrow. You say, um, the Mosaic tabernacle was a figure of the true? It was a figure of the true? The Greek word there, interestingly, is antitupos, antitupos, which um, is where we get the idea of antitype. You have a type in the Old Testament. You have an antitype in the New Testament. But here, the Apostle Paul in Hebrews 9 is saying that the earthly tabernacle that Moses erected was an antitype of the true in heaven. It was a pattern or an antitype of the true thing In heaven, the very pattern that Moses saw when he ascended the mountain, he was to construct the earthly tabernacle after that particular design. Now, when you hear that, you have to step back and say, we we need to start thinking about heaven and earth. Here we are on Ascension Sunday, and modern man's assumptions don't do well with Ascension Sunday. Uh, Modern man's materialistic assumptions don't do good with the Christian faith. They don't square with the Christian faith. But but here particularly, you're saying he ascended into heaven. Like, when he went up, where did he go? Did he just keep going? Is he still going up? We say, no, he entered into heaven. But to even um, grasp the import of that glorious truth here on Ascension Sunday, you have to know a thing or two about heaven. What does the Bible tell us about heaven and earth themselves. Well, we might not know everything that we would like to know, but we actually know a lot more than we think if we pay attention to what Scripture tells us. What is this place, heaven, and what is its relationship to earth? Well, first, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 tells us, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So heaven, whatever it is, heaven is created. It's a created place. Heaven has not always been around. God is eternal. The heavens are not eternal. The heavens were created. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The Apostle Paul speaks of those heavens that God created in the beginning. He speaks of them as the third heaven. And he says that he actually went there. He went to the third heaven. He went to the heaven of heavens. 
we know that this place really exists. On the second day of creation, we're told of a firmament, a firmament that God creates that's somewhat of a, of a, a division, somewhat separating earth and heaven. It separates the heavens above the firmament from the earth below the firmament. The language in Genesis is separates the waters above the firmament from the waters below the firmament, but I take that to mean the firmament separates heaven from earth. One of the reasons for doing so is that this firmament shows up again in Ezekiel's vision. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 25 says this, and there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads. Uh, their heads are these living creatures. So these living creatures somehow descend below the firmament. The firmament is above their heads, and Ezekiel hears a voice from the firmament. There they stood and had let down their wings, these living creatures. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne and the appearance of a sapphire stone and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man upon it. So in Ezekiel's vision, you have the firmament, and above the firmament, you have a throne, a sapphire throne, dazzling blue, with a man seated upon it, seated there in heaven. The appearance of sapphire comes to us again when Moses went up the mountain, and saw the heavenly tabernacle, which served as a type of the earthly. So this same color, this same stone, appears in Exodus chapter 24, verse 9. There it says this, Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work, of sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. Heaven and earth, God created them. Heaven and earth, they exist. Modern man, do what you will with it. A sapphire throne or a sapphire paved work beneath the feet of God as Moses ascends the mountain to meet with him there. He sees God and God gives him the design. I want you to go construct an earthly tabernacle according to the one that you saw on the mountain. One more picture of heaven we see in Revelation chapter 15, verse 1. There we hear these words. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God. So the Apostle John has this vision of heaven, and he has a vision of saints that had conquered on earth, had ascended into heaven, and then stood on a sea. And what did they sing when they stood on that sea? They sang the song of Moses. Now, you remember when the song of Moses was sung first. Israel crossed the Red Sea, stood on the other side. Pharaoh's army is buried beneath the sea, and what do they sing on the other side of the sea? Praise God, the horse and his rider, he is thrown into the sea. They crossed the sea and they sang the song of Moses. And now we hear in Revelation that there are other saints who have ascended into heaven and crossed a sea that's above our heads. A sea that's above our heads. And then they stood on it and they sang what? The song of Moses, the song of victory. The horse and the rider, he's thrown into the sea. Our God has saved us. The water is above the firmament. The water is below the firmament. This sea, this glorious heaven. What are we to make of all of this? If we're going to see how glorious it is that Christ has ascended into heaven, we first must know what it is. And here's a summary. There is a real created place called the heavens. It goes by the name of the third heaven in Scripture, or the highest heaven. It is the dwelling place of our Father to whom we pray every week, our Father in heaven, hallowed 
be your name. This third heaven, the real created place, is called the true tabernacle in Scripture. This is Hebrews chapter 8, verse 2. This is the way that the world is really constructed. It's critical to know where you are. You do not live in a mere world of materialism. You live in a world that has been created by God. He created the heavens and he created the earth. With that much established, the next question is, what is the relationship between heaven and earth? Does what goes on in heaven matter down here? Does what goes on on earth matter in heaven? Well, God's pattern is regularly, routinely in Scripture and in life on earth as it is in heaven. The way, the way God works is from heaven to earth, not the other way around. Take the Lord's Prayer, for instance. We pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We don't say, your kingdom come, your will be done in heaven as it is on earth. To say that would be to turn everything upside down. If we, if we prayed that, if we sang that one Sunday, you would know that something had gone terribly wrong. This is not the way God has designed the world to work. Or take King David in the Old Testament with his great army, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 24. David does what before he goes to battle continually? He inquires of God. Something's going on down here, and David says, God, should I go? He speaks to the God of heaven, and God tells him yes. God tells him no. It's the very thing that Saul neglected. King Saul didn't do that kind of thing. He didn't care about the God of heaven, and he was doomed on earth because of it. But in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 24, when David goes through one of these processes, he says, God, should I go up? And God says, don't go up to fight this battle until you hear the marching atop the mulberry trees. I can tell you, that wasn't people, wasn't humans, wasn't gorillas on top of the mulberry trees. It was the angelic army. You wait until you hear the sound of marching atop the mulberry trees. The angelic army went out to battle first, and David's army followed on earth. We see the same kind of process in something like church discipline or excommunication from the church. In Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 18, we have the same phrase in both of those passages. And he says, I give you the keys of the kingdom, and what you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. But the idea is not that heaven is therefore following what happens on earth. The actual language of both of those passages is what you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. What you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Even there in the, in the ecclesiastical realm, in the realm of the church, as discipline happens, what's happening down here is not only corresponding to heaven, but is actually following what has happened in heaven. One other example of this would be our Sabbath worship. We long to see ourselves sanctified. We long to see the church of Christ built. And what is the very day upon which that happens to the fullest degree? It happens on the Sabbath when we rest, when the humans gather to worship the Lord and then don't work. You think, well, if you want to be building the kingdom, like, shouldn't you be after it? I mean, every good businessman knows this. Every, you're going to take one day off in seven, you're going to lose. Let me just tell you right now, I'm a practical man. I know how things work around here. I'm telling you, if you rest one day in seven and the other guy works seven straight, you're going to lose. He's going to beat you. Guess what? That very practical businessman is wrong. The response is like, oh, well, we're Christians, so we'll do the right thing and you guys can win down here on earth. You might build a better business because you have seven. No, that's not true. It actually doesn't work that way. Why? Because there's a God in heaven who works in you to will and to work. There's a God in heaven. As it is on earth, it is because of heaven. 
So many of our problems come from bossing heaven around. We want to stand on earth and we want to boss heaven around. That's exactly what's going on in the trans movement. We're seeing that ideology manifest itself in the insanity of our times. That trans movement says, I don't care what heaven made me. I will tell you and I will tell heaven what I really am. I will undo or attempt to undo in reality what heaven itself has done. But you see, we can't shake our finger at the trans movement because we've been doing this kind of thing in our society for a very long time. This is what no-fault divorce is all about. No-fault divorce, been around for decades. What is that? Well, in marriage, the God of heaven binds two people together. What God has joined together, God, the God of heaven, let man not separate, but no-fault divorce says, no, we'll separate it. We'll tell heaven what's really going on around here. So one of the problems is bossing heaven around. God says, you're forgiven. And you say, well, no, I'm not God. Who are you to talk back to heaven? God said you're forgiven. God said you're a Christian. God said that he loves you. God said that you're an adopted son or daughter of him. You have no right to boss heaven around. Our other problems come from severing heaven from earth. So maybe we we don't boss heaven around, but what we want to do is we basically want to take uh, the heavens that God has created that are over the earth, and we want to separate them entirely from the earth and just cast them away into a realm of insignificance. This is what Francis Schaeffer talked about in his book, Escape from Reason. There is the upper story, heavenly things, heaven and heavenly things, and the lower story, earth and earthly things. And we've just decided that we'll get on here, on earth, doing our business, raising our families, going about our lives. We'll do all of that regardless of heaven. It just doesn't matter what's going on up there. And then the secular world says to you, you can still like do your heavenly thing if you want to, But just don't pretend that it's going to have any kind of manifestation down here on earth. But then when the saints come and pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we have serious problems. After the secular world has claimed that heaven is irrelevant, but you can kind of do your heavenly thing if you want to in your heart, they begin to limit vertically where you can do it. You can't do it outside of the four walls of your church. You can't do it outside the four walls of your home. You can't do it outside of your heart. You really can't do it outside of your head. You can do it in your head because that's the only place that it's real. That's the only place that it exists, you see? We stand and say, no. You can see how you don't have any boldness if you buy into that particular ideology of the day. The truth is, God's glorious kingdom is coming on earth as it is in heaven. This is the way that God always works. You then need to know, if you are forgiven in heaven, and you are forgiven in heaven, then you are forgiven down here on earth. If you are cleansed in heaven, then you are cleansed down here on earth. Now, with these first two points, the stage is set for the glory of of the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, our particular passage. First point is, there's a thing called the heavens. There's a thing called the earth, and we need to know what it is. The second point is, the pattern God always works in the world is from heaven to earth. This is the way he does things. But things get even more strange now. Because in the ascension, we say that the Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. That is, we believe a virgin conceived a full and complete human who was also fully and completely God. Then this God-man died, rose again, and descended into the third heaven. That's where he went when the cloud received him, as the book of Acts just told us. And you ask, what what are you really saying? Here's what we're saying. A real man with a real resurrected body is now in the third heaven. Material is in heaven. A physical body is lodged in the spiritual realm. This 
is a glorious truth. It's one that we can't get our head all the way around, of course. It's one that we receive by faith. And then we have to consider what Christ did there. Christ has ascended into heaven. What did he do? Our passage says that he purified, cleansed the heavenly things themselves. Now, you're right to ask, why would the heavenly things need to be cleansed or purified? What is that about? Well, we hear in Leviticus, in the Day of Atonement, that they walked into the very holy of holies and even sprinkled the mercy seat. And you say, why does the mercy seat need to be sprinkled? Don't, the people can be sprinkled because they're corrupt. Why are you sprinkling the tabernacle itself? And the answer is because that is the dwelling place of God with man. It has to be purified because the Israelites were in there. That's why it had to be purified. Now you say, why did the third heavens have to be purified by better sacrifices than the Mosaic sacrifices? And the answer is because we are in there. We are in there. When Christ descended into heaven, he took us with him. That's what... Paul means in verse 24 of our text when he says, He has entered into heaven itself to appear before the face of God for us. For us. Is Christ not our head? Yes, he is our head. Are we not Christ's body? We are Christ's body. If he is our head and we are his body, when he ascended into the third heaven, we went with him. We are there represented by him. This is why the book of Ephesians tells us, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Now, you see, I'm telling you something that's actually true. You have to, you have to receive it. But faith, faith says you receive everything that God has said. And as you do, your heart is enlarged. As you do, you're sanctified. As you do, you find boldness that you didn't think that you had. You find it by this truth, knowing that you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places to such a degree that the heavenly things themselves, the heavenly, heavenly tabernacle, had to be purified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what God has done for us. Now you flip the coin on this particular truth and look at the other side. We have entered into heaven in Christ. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. But it's also true that heaven has entered into earth in Christ. Paul tells us in the book of Hebrews that Christ has made a new and living way into the Holy of Holies. He's made a new and living way through the veil. And then he says, and the veil was his flesh. Remember, when Christ died, the veil of the temple is torn in two. And Paul picks up on that theme and says, you know, that veil is Christ's flesh. He has been torn in two, sprinkled the tabernacle. Imagine the, imagine the curtain being torn in two and that curtain being Christ's flesh. Blood's everywhere. Blood is, the, the whole temple is dedicated. You are dedicated. You are cleansed and pardoned of your sin. You can enter now into that holy place and be there. But now think about the secular humanist that, uh, his whole endeavor is to box up your Christianity to some little tight four-walled place. Imagine him standing there, looking at the Holy of Holies, saying, okay, you can have it. You can have that one little spot on earth, but everything else belongs to us. God is boxed up there in that one little spot, but he can't go anywhere else. And now imagine Christ, Christ dies and the veil is torn in two. Not only can you now enter into the Holy of Holies, but the Holy of Holies has come out and invaded the earth. We wanted to keep that thing closed. We wanted to keep him boxed up into heaven, into this irrelevant sphere. We wanted to have our way down here on earth and keep that curtain. They want to sew the curtain up, but you can't sew the curtain up because it's Christ's flesh. And he died on the cross. And when he did, he triumphed over the enemy. 
You say, why don't we have an earthly temple like the Old Testament? You say, well, because we have a true, a real, heavenly one. We see this glorious truth in, in a couple different texts. So I want to give you two texts to grasp this idea of the kingdom of heaven itself, this glorious tabernacle actually manifesting itself on earth. First would be John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. There he preaches, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And John the Baptist preached that particular message when his feet were firmly planted on soil. When you say something is at hand, you mean it's here. It's close by. I'm not telling you something. I'm not telling you about a place that's far away. I'm telling you about a place that is here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why did he preach that message? Because the virgin had conceived and born a son. Because Christ had come to earth, bringing heaven with him. The other text is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 through 24. There we hear these words. Ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable company of angels. Now, you understand the Apostle Paul is writing to a particular people. He's writing to saints, and he did this 2,000 years ago. We are saints receiving God's word now, and, and the word is, you are come to the heavenly Jerusalem. You are come to to the city of God. You are come to innumerable angels. That language is not future tense. It's not talking about something that you will experience in the future only. It's talking about a particular manifestation of this truth right now. You say, you say we are come to angels right now? Yes. Where are they? I can't see them. You already know the answer. They're in heaven. It's where the angels fly. You are come, have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. The text goes on, to the general assembly in church of the firstborn. You've come to this, which are written in heaven. And you've come to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, into the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. You have come to all of this. You have come to the blood of sprinkling that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, what does that mean? What did the blood of Abel speak? You remember? Cain murders his brother, Abel. Abel's blood covers the earth. And that blood, from the ground, the text says, from the ground, cried out to the God of heaven, from the earth, and the God of heaven heard. And he came to Cain and he said, the blood of your brother Abel cries out to me from the earth. What have you done? What have you done in your sin? The message was testifying to the sin of Cain. And God heard in heaven. But you saints have come and been sprinkled by blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What is that better word? Christ shed his blood on the cross. That blood ran down that cross and soaked the earth. And from the earth, it cries out to the God of heaven and says, You are clean. You are washed. You are purified. In the heavenly tabernacle, that glorious sapphire stone, his feet placed upon that sapphire pavement with the other saints standing on that glorious crystal sea, singing the song of victory. Down here on earth, the blood of Christ cries out to God and says, you are forgiven. It is done. That blood that covered the earth also was sprinkled in the heavenly tabernacle, sprinkled on the true mercy seat sprinkled on the true altar. And you find yourself both there and here at the same time. Purified and cleansed in heaven, purified and cleansed on earth. If all of that is true, what could you possibly be afraid of? How could you not have boldness here 
on earth. You say, well, I had a big hospitality event and you won't believe it, I overcooked the biscuits. Serve them with boldness. With boldness. And schedule the next event in boldness. You say, I really like her, but I don't want to ask her name. Ask her name in boldness. Talk to her dad in boldness. You say, I haven't been the father that I'm supposed to be, and my kids are old enough now, you don't understand, they're old enough now that if I make an adjustment now, they're going to know. If I make an adjustment now, my wife's going to know I'm trying to, I'm trying to put on some kind of new man that I haven't put on for years. Put it on in boldness. You are forgiven. You've been washed clean. You're in heaven with Christ. The blood of Christ has pardoned you and cleansed you. It's all done. You're washed white in his blood. You must Go forth in boldness. You say, there's some sin in my life. You don't understand. It hangs around. I've looked at it. I've tried to deal with it in the past. I've tried to deal with it, but then it beat me again. And I, I, I picked it up six months later, and I tried to, tried to confess it again, but it beat me again. I don't want to even look at it. I don't want to pay attention. It just compartmentalized it in my life. I'm not going to deal with it. Go face that sin in boldness because you are sprinkled by the blood of of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've not come to the old covenant. You come to something far better than Moses sprinkling you with water mixed with blood. You have come to the blood of Jesus Christ, the new covenant. You are bound to the God of heaven. He is resolved by the blood of Christ to do you good, to sanctify you, to wash you, to purify you, to cleanse you. And you must, with boldness, walk into all of that. The Apostle Paul says, having boldness then to enter into the holiest place, the very holiest place, let us then, with the full assurance of faith, draw near to this living God. Draw near to Him. You say, well, you don't understand. I've grown cold in my Bible reading. I haven't picked up the Bible in a long time. How could I pick it up now? You pick it up with boldness. That's how you pick it up. I haven't prayed. I haven't asked God for things in a long time. Then you pray to Him with boldness. That's how you pray. It's always boldness. Think of it this way. If you can walk into heaven itself right now, the holiest place in boldness, which is exactly what Paul tells you you can do in Hebrews chapter 10, then you can walk into any place with boldness. Down here on earth, Down here on earth where God manifests his kingdom, any place I failed at business, go start another one in boldness. Do it in boldness. Get married in boldness. Have children in boldness. Raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You say, I'm I'm nervous about my children. I'm afraid. I'm sitting there always kind of peering into the secret things, wondering how it's going to turn out with them. Don't you understand that they are in the heavenly tabernacle with you, sprinkled by the blood of Christ? Well, they stumbled, but they fell. Yeah, they fell. You know where? Right by the mercy seat. That itself is sprinkled by the blood of Christ. Trust the Lord, take him at his word, and enter into all that he's called you to in boldness. Our Father, we thank you for your kindness to us, for your amazing mercy that you've shown us in your Son. We thank you for his blood that speaks a better word concerning us than the blood of Abel. Be glorified as we worship you now. As we do, we pray to you the prayer you've taught us to pray, saying, After Moses took blood and sprinkled the altar, the book of the covenant, and the people at Mount Sinai, he went up on the mountain with Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 of the elders of Israel. There on that mountain, they saw God, and they ate and drank. The covenant had been cut, the sacrifices offered, and a meal with God followed. The same is true for us today. Here we are on Mount Zion. Through worship, we have offered ourselves to God as living sacrifices. He has announced His covenant promises to us, and now we sit down to a meal with Him, as Moses did many years ago. As you eat and drink, do so by faith, and that by faith means that you lay hold of everything God has revealed. Is this meal just like any other? No. Paul had strong words for the Corinthians who were selfishly coming to this table neglecting each other in the process. His rebuke was, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? 
They sinned by considering the church of God a little insignificant thing. They had grown to treat this table as if it were just another Tuesday night spaghetti dinner on paper plates. Learn from their mistake. Steady yourselves. Prepare yourselves. You have come to eat and drink with God. God gives us many signs in creation. The trees remind us of Christ's cross. The dove reminds us of the Holy Spirit. But this table does more than remind us. This table is a sacrament through which we, by faith, commune with the living God. Come, renewing your love to him. Come, renewing your love for one another. Come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for being our covenant-keeping God. We thank you for your glorious church and the forgiveness we have through your son's blood. Strengthen our faith, for we come to you in Jesus' name, and amen. Here's the charge. Our boldness is not cosplay boldness. You're familiar with this? People dress up in costumes, and then they're very brave, pretending to be someone else. You really are you, and because you are in Christ, you are in the real tabernacle with real holiness and real forgiveness. You're in a real battle with real boldness. So with believing hearts, receive the benediction of our God. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen.